sound, vibration, frequency, energy, silence. These are all topics that I have absolutely been fascinated by and wanted to learn more about. So I decided to go on a journey and make a documentary called Going Home. The documentary is out, it's available, it came out a few months ago, you can watch it on a variety of different platforms. And although the film is out, the journey continues. I want to learn more because there is always something to be learned. So Nikola Tesla said, if you want to find the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. Totally makes sense since we are all energy, we are all vibration, right? You may be looking around me saying, oh, what is all that stuff she's sitting by? Well, perhaps you've experienced a sound bath, a sound healing, a sound meditation, a sound immersion. There's so many different labels and terms that people call it. If you haven't experienced it, then what you do is a practitioner would invite you to come in and maybe it's one-on-one, -on -one, maybe it's in a group, maybe it's virtually, and just find a comfortable position. Maybe you're laying down, maybe you're seated. Just find comfort and connect with your breath. And then the practitioner would play the tools that they've put together. And when I say tools, I'm talking about the crystal singing bowls, I'm talking about the metal singing bowls, maybe it's flutes, maybe it's drums, maybe it's chimes. Can be a lot of different things. Every practitioner is very different, right? And you'll find different people resonate with different tools and also practitioners. Consider the sound journey a massage for your nervous system, right? It helps you to calm the mind, to find inner stillness, to connect with your breath, to reduce anxiety. It is a really great way to relax. Just allow yourself to be the human being part of human being, right? To breathe and be. So that's what a sound journey is. And some of you may say, I go every week. It is such a great tool for sure. You can also use gongs in your sound journey. And I wanted to learn more about gongs because there's so many different ways that you can use the gong, depending on the mallet you use, the thing that you use to strike it, you know? It can sound like waves crashing, or maybe it sounds like a whale. And there's so many different kinds of gongs that you could use. So I wanted to learn more about gongs and sounds. So I went to my friend and one of my favorite gong makers, Sean Aceto in Rhode Island, to learn more. I'm Sean Aceto. We're in Wakefield, Rhode Island, and I'm a gong maker. It really started with singing bowls. It started with wanting a means to free my mind of all the activity I had, of everything I had going on, all the mind chatter, all the you know, different aspects of daily life. So I found sound as a way to escape that because it was the only thing that would make me present. That, that feeling and then there was a segue into gongs to selling gongs and then ultimately into making them where I am now. If you could tell us how this whole thing works, how does this whole process work? So this is where it starts? Yeah, this is where it starts. So it starts with a sheet of nickel silver that's come out of Germany. Wow. Uh, it takes a long time to get them. You have to wait for the travel, travel by boat across the ocean. What they don't show you when you buy a gong is the metal. I don't know if you can see how grainy that is. Oh, yeah. And this is copper, nickel, and zinc. So it's got some It's got some heavy weight to it. It's got some inherent oh, wow. sound to it. So we start from here, um, and then we're gonna mark it and get it ready to go. So this one I'm, I'm set up to burn. And this is a Saturn gong. This is one of my favorites to make. So you can see the line is kind of etched in there. This is actually the back. So there's no mark in the center oh, yeah, there for reference. Oh yeah, I can see. So why, you said this is the Saturn gong, so why is this your favorite? Um, because I get to burn it a lot. I like playing with the torch because that for me is meditative. You're watching the colors, you're watching the material change, you're watching it move.
So now that we're done with this, you can feel the heat is still coming off of it. And it's gonna oh my be, gosh. it's gonna be a little while before it cools down and it may pop and jump because the material is still is still changing. When it heats up, it spreads out. And in a non-ferrous metal, when it, when it heats up, it spreads out. And if it cools slowly, it gets harder. If it cools fast, it gets softer because the molecules stop. Gotcha. Whereas on a steel, a ferrous product, when you cool it right away, the molecules jam together and it makes it really hard and stiff. This is the opposite. So we'll let that cool on the grill here for a while. And I won't touch this now until tomorrow. But you can see the different color gradients in here. Right all around here, and unlike the, the traditional German, I stop and I do in sections. Yeah, this it reminds me like the color scheme of this and the lines. It, it reminds me of something from nature. You it, know, it something is, that it you is would nature. see. So when yeah. the Cassini spacecraft went out into space and it captured the image of Saturn with the sun coming through it, the northern and southern, the southern hemispheres had this hexagon shape to them. And there's a storm brewing in the middle of it, but this is what it looks like. You see the circle, and then you see a hexagon in the clouds. Hence the Saturn piece that you just created. Yeah, exactly. You know, not a not a planetary tuning, but more of a visual and a, an aesthetic, an aesthetic piece to it. That's incredible. So it's it's not just saying, you know, I'm going to design a gong, and I'm going to call it Saturn. Like you did the research on what that would look like as Saturn. Yeah, the, the inspiration comes from from nature. That's incredible. It comes from esoterics. It comes from the, the things in our world that maybe we take for granted until we actually look at it. Because like people like to attach to things. They like to have something that they wanna they wanna play with. But I, for me, it's a sound character. It's a tone. It's a, it's a feeling. It's about inspiring awe. When you're at the ocean, when you hear a thunderstorm, when you hear a train coming, it's that visceral feeling that you connect with. It just makes you go, oh. you're fully present in that. Like that's your only focus is that. And that's what I try to create with these. To be fair, sometimes it's not passion. Sometimes it's swears. Sometimes <laughs> there's a lot of swears that go into these, right? Because you get something like this and it, this is going to be very difficult. And at times it's going to be very frustrating. So there's, there's sometimes there's a lot of F-bombs, there's a lot of sweat, and a lot of frustration, but you know, the end result is just amazing. And the, you know, the, I think the more you hit it, the more the, the crystalline structure within it starts to compress and give it a very different sound. And then sometimes that comes through. Yeah, These so things are beat to death. Yeah. They're, they're beat relentlessly, probably a thousand hits in each one. Wow. Yeah. So I'll show you the, the product that, that we get next. Okay. okay. So All right. Good. Yeah, okay, that cool. sounds great. This is so incredible. Okay, so the next step we do is we, we run it through and we hammer it out and get that edge done. And you can see it's a nice little almost 90 degree tuck in there. It looks kind of like a bottle cap. And what that does is stretches the membrane out and starts to give it some tension. Because like any percussion instrument, it's, it's all about the tension and the tightness. And as we work on this, because the metal, the way it's rolled, it wants to curl up. It's going to be a fight from this point on to keep this part of the membrane flat. That's a heck of a workout too. And that's the smallest hammer. Yeah. <laughs> you know, with everything in here, the table, a lot of these hammers I have, you know. It's stuff I had to make and stuff I had to engineer because there's no gong tool store. There's no gong table store. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that that's where my building, building background comes in. So now we'll go around this and try to get that round and even keep it flat. And then we'll go to the tuning stage, which I can show you next. Okay, that would be great. So now that we have the shape here, we're, the next thing we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to start to tune it. We're basically making a membrane like a drum. So this, this line that you see out here in, in the traditional German gong kind of brings that membrane nice and tight. And then from there it's hammered out in here, which is going to give it its tuning and its sound character, depending on how that's done. So the center is actually hammered too, yes. but it looks so smooth. This is smooth so far. This one is not tuned yet. Something like this is going to require a little more nuance and a little more tactile sensitivity to it. And you'll see that again with the showroom with the different styles that we have where I can take a gong this size and make five different gongs on it and they're all going to feel very different. They're going to have a very different sensation to them and you'll need a different attack with each one that you play. All right, I can't believe we went from start to finish on Yeah, it only takes five minutes, gong. folks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, this was such a treat. This is outstanding. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Let's go check out the showroom and, and play with some, some finished product. That would be awesome. So we've been talking a little bit about gongs, right? A little bit. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> so a gong, we've got all different kinds of sizes of gongs, um, different styles in terms of the way they look and the way they sound. So how do you play a gong? So there's a lot of different methods that people use, but the basics are you know, a regular mallet. This is a very broad, broad head. And that's going to bring out the real lows, the sub octaves. And something this size will bring you down about 22, 23 hertz. close to imperceptible to the human ear, but you can feel it. Yeah. That's there. There's a static charge that comes off of this. Go into different sizes and it starts essentially playing itself. Smaller, generally harder. So you're like building it with each tap. Very, very little at a time. Mm -hmm. And you can go even even smaller with one of these. And a lot of times people will see a gong this size and they want you to hit it really hard and they want you to smash it. It doesn't work. You miss all that little nuance. You miss all the extra little sounds that come out. And it's gonna sound different on your side then it doesn't mind. So the gong's going through its own journey yep. and finding its rhythm while the participant is also going through a journey. Absolutely. You know, this sound may take them to a very unique place and each person that their associative memory might bring them to a very different place with the exact same sound, just like smell does. Oh, this was awesome. Thank you. Ah, what a magical journey that was with Sean Aceto, learning how the gong is made. How cool is that? So that is the making of the gong, right? And if you've ever experienced a Sean Aceto gong, then you will feel the passion. You will feel and hear the passion that he puts into each one of his creations. It's really incredible. If you want to learn more about Sean, you can go to his website, SeanAcetoSounds.com. Um, and now, what about the other gongs? There's so many different kinds of gongs out there. So I went to my friend, Mike Tambiro, who is a performer, and he has traveled throughout the country selling out shows. He's got all kinds of music on Bandcamp and quite a collection of gongs. So I asked him if he could show us a little more about the world of gongs. My name is Mike Tambiro. Previous to COVID, I was a uh, performing artist and I traveled all around the country. I would do workshops talking about metal instruments and allowing people to play a variety of metal instruments. And so a lot of my work has, uh, has built around the gong and built around metal instruments that sustained for long periods of time. And the sound of the gong is something that, that's you know, different and really interesting and, and, and really mysterious. You know, the way that it, it offers an entry point for the listener to enter in between the oscillating frequencies. And then it's almost like the dream world opens up and the sound is, is, is navigating the listener through this inner experience, this inner reality. As we process all this information coming in through our nervous system over time, you know, something interesting is definitely going on. And it's different for every single person. Uh, whenever I listen to it, you know, I, I really enter into kind of a dream. You know, that my experiences are like a Turia state, kind of like on a, on a journey. It's, it's usually beautiful. And sometimes I cry. Sometimes I'm confronted with something that is like really hard and I forgot about it. But it's like the gong is like pulsing against some part of my body and I start having this, this, this memory and then a physical release from the body along with that. 
And that, that's something that's happened to me a number of times. Okay, so Mike, there are so many different gongs represented in your studio here. So I'm guessing that each of them probably has a different origin. Maybe they're made of different things. So can you kind of take us down that journey and explain some of them to us? Like we can start with this one, which is the wind gong. Yeah, so, so, so this is a wind gong or, or sometimes known as a feng gong. Uh, this is made of bronze. Uh, this came from China. Gotcha. And I see you have some mallets, so would you mind putting those to the gong and showing us how they work? I would love to. Okay, I'll, I'll switch over with you. All right. Uh, so I'm going to use a, a friction mallet, and I'm going to use a, uh, this is actually a bass drum mallet, but I just like the way that it sounds on gongs. different those tools it's amazing the sounds that they produce and how different those sounds are so with the friction mallet you're holding it you're putting it it looks like gently against the gun and just kind of dragging it correct yeah I'm creating a, kind of a, it's like gripping and then slipping and gripping and slipping so it's, it's friction and whenever you approach a gun like that it brings out a different series of tones than when you strike it so this what we're hearing is it's, it's very smooth. That's the harmonic series. So it's more like what a voice or, or the string. Uh, and then whenever you're striking with a mallet, it has a lot more to do with uh, how, where you're striking, how the instrument is flexing, uh, how hard you're striking. And, and uh, you know, the, 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 the gong is moving in you know, so many different ways, more than we can even imagine. So. We've got the wind gong here, but I see like a whole line, like a whole room of different gongs or what appear to be gongs. So can you tell us a little bit more about some of these? Like, for example, what are these down here? Are these gongs? Because they look like they might be, but then they also look like maybe they're considered something else. Yeah, the, uh, you know, I kind of consider these to be a fine line between a gong and a, and a bell plate. This is made of B20 bronze. This was cast, this one also. This was made by Ryan Shelody. And then this, they consider this a Tibetan gong. It's most likely made in Nepal though. So we have kind of a pure tone, more of like a bell-like tone. And a different mallet is being used for, for these. Yeah, I decided to use a harder mallet on, on these. They, they require uh, a different touch. And, and every mallet is gonna give you a different, a different sound. So. And what about, we've got some down here. Sure, what, what these, are, these? these are chow gongs. Uh, this is a 24 inch and I think this is maybe a 16 inch. These are a little low to the ground. And what's the origin of these and what are these made out of? These are Chinese and really they're considered tam-tams. A tam-tam is essentially flat. We've been calling everything gongs now. Yeah. But a uh, tam-tam has a, a flat face um, or a near flat face. So okay. we would also consider a wind gong to be a tam-tam. Uh, okay. but, but this has a, a rim. And, uh, you know, they're, they're all different thicknesses, but the, the rim creates a boundary. And so you get this really kind of concentrated tone with, 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 with the chow gong. And it's pretty true across the board. Or sometimes you'll get a little bit of a growl with the chow gong as well. And then what about this one? This is really interesting to look at. This is made by the Minel Company. With this type of gong, you know, they're making these somewhat commercially, so I can get a different planet gong. You know, so if something were to happen to this instrument, I could get another one that would essentially be the same frequency. So you know, the central tone would be the same. A lot of the overtones would be different because every gong is, is different, but then also using the friction mallet, I would be able to get a similar tone. So this is what I'm looking for whenever I'm thinking about a planetary gong. I want, you know, essentially that, that central tone be nice and deep. So I, I could essentially get this on another instrument as well. So I think that's interesting about this. It's going to be a little bit different from gong to gong, but you have some aspects that are going to be the same from instrument to instrument or near the same. And maybe I wouldn't be able to recognize how different it was unless they're right next to each very, other. Very, very cool. Thank you. I think mm -hmm. that's beautiful. So, Mike, we already, we saw this is the chow gong. So we saw smaller versions of this on the other side. So it's 
kind of the same concept, just a larger gong. But over here, it looks like we've got something else. It's a rectangle, so would this, would this be considered a gong too, or is this something completely different from a gong? This is made by Grotta Sonora. They're calling it, I believe now, the cosmic plate. I still consider it a gong. Some people may consider this a plate or, or maybe like a thunder sheet. It's definitely very gong-like. Uh, something that you know, is, is interesting is think about gongs being different shapes. And, and, and uh, so this is what a rectangle would sound like. Slightly different than, uh, than a gong. Whereas if I strike this, you know, that, that's a really strong, strong pitch. So you hear a lot of these gongs and, and, and the upper harmonics are, are coming out very quickly. Some of Grotta Sonora's new instruments, I haven't heard them in, in person, but he's getting some really deep sounds. So, you know, every gong maker, I believe, continues to evolve over time. You know, so we, we see some early works, you know, from, from Grotta Sonora and people like Sean Aceto. But then it's interesting to watch their evolution because uh, you know gong and, and gong culture really changes as as people bring in more more instruments and, and approach the instruments in different ways. Okay, and then what what about these down here? I mean, this has a really interesting face to it. So, what can you tell us more about these? Yeah, so we have uh, th these are often called sun gongs, or, or sometimes they've also been called lunar gongs. I think we just have some concentric circles. They're essentially a wind gong. The sound to me is uh, a little more concentrated than one gong, a little less, less splashy, maybe a little bit darker. Uh, and again, we're seeing it doesn't have that, it's very thin, it doesn't have that rim that goes around it. Right? Yeah, well and then also this is important, the thickness of this is a matter of what's giving me the tone. You know, so Got it. we heard kind of that splashiness. It's very different if this instrument was a little bit thicker or a little bit larger. It would sound, it'd sound different, I guess, a different tone. Another instrument that is a fine line between a, a, being a gong or a bell. So this is the Kizi, and it is considered to be a gong, spinning gong. Often you have two ropes. Now this particular one is, is uh, Italian, but these are, are Burmese. And they were generally considered to be an instrument uh, for tranquility and peace. Now, as an artist, I'm, I'm using these in conjunction with other instruments. Uh, I hardly ever play it by itself, but, but it's something that can be used for uh, personal sound meditation. It's, it's very nice. Okay, well, that's a good tip. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Thank yeah, you so much. Fun. So what a wonderful insight into the variety of gongs that are available.